uh, I'm very excited about this this keynote. Um, Greg is Greg is someone I've actually known for quite a few years now. Uh, someone I'm I'm happily able to call a a virtual friend. We've met dozens of times on camera. We've done webcasts together. We've done research together. We've done all sorts of things together. Um, we just haven't been able to make it to the uh, snowy apocalyptic ash that's known as San Francisco in the same time frame, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, Greg is co-founder and chief strategy officer over at Corelight. And uh, when we kind of thought about the idea of threat hunting, um, some of you who have taken classes with us, you'll know that Phil and myself have a certain penchant for network forensics, network traffic and things along that line. And uh, Greg is someone who, who I think shares and believes in some of that same passion. So we're super excited to have him. Um, his talk is going to be the open NDR, sorry, open NDR and the great pendulum. And I don't want to spoil anything. So what I'm going to simply do is say, Greg, it's an honor to introduce you to this, sir. Thank you for joining us and take it away. Oh, thanks so much for that introduction, Matt. Greatly appreciated. Um, greetings here from my eclectic Airbnb in uh, famously eclectic Berkeley, California. It's a little less apocalyptic today. I'm just looking outside. The sky is not red. So I'm hoping that we'll have a normal day today. You may have read about the, the snowing ash in the news. Um, it's a great honor to be invited to speak to you. Welcome. Um, and, you know, this talk is substantially really about community and about the attractions and power of community. SANS itself is a great community, and um, I particularly appreciate the remarks that Matt gave at the beginning about the culture we're trying to establish together. Culture takes work, uh, and norms take work to define, and so I thought that was really well delivered and an important message. So let's get going here and see if I can advance. All right. I. Much of this talk at the end will be about career paths, so I thought I would start by introducing myself and a little bit telling you a little bit about my own career path, which has been uh, non-traditional. I've had a lot of twists and turns. I started early on working in human rights for Amnesty International and other human rights organizations. Um, went to grad school, got a PhD in a completely unrelated field. But at a certain point, my career torn, turned towards technical work. And I started, I, I was a programmer as a kid, so that wasn't such a difficult leap for me. But I started and was attracted immediately, you know, as, as Matt mentioned, to networking. I really see the world through those seven layers. I love the idea of layered abstractions and the puzzle the puzzles that networking presents. And I got a job just very, very fortunately as a frontline network engineer at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in the DOE National Lab System and spent most of my career in federal service with .gov and my email address. And, uh, you know, it was just a frontline network engineer with a punch down tool solving complex problems uh, all day. And I really enjoyed that work. It was a good place to learn about security as well. So uh, in the telco room slash data center I worked in most every day, there was this intriguing graffiti scrawled at the top of one of the fiber racks. I don't know if you can see that, but it says on this site, the Hanover hacker was caught August 86 to July 87 and signed by Lloyd, Paul, Keith and Cliff. Cliff was and is Cliff Stoll, who wrote The Cuckoo's Egg. If you haven't read that book, I would strongly recommend it. And I, and I worked, he, he had retired by the time I started, but I worked with Lloyd and Keith quite a bit. And over the course of my very rewarding career there, I worked my way up into a position of leadership. And I ran the Global Mission Network for the US Department of Energy, a really, really interesting job full of challenges um, really at the cutting and bleeding edge of global research networking. That's networking to accelerate scientific discovery, to acquire and uh, move large, large data sets. Um, and I like to say it was the best job in networking, and I really think it was. I, I had lots of interesting challenges. Like for instance, we built the world's first multi-hundred gigabit transatlantic network to support scientific discovery at the Large Hadron Collider. So I learned a lot about how the internet gets under the ocean. Uh, and uh, if for those of you that have fiber to the home, if you're fortunate enough, you've seen little fiber service loops. They're little loops of fiber that technicians install to make sure if there's an, if there's an oops moment and they need to fuse or re-terminate or um, fiber is not quite long enough, um, there's just a little bit of extra fiber to do the job and it helps uh, with the bend radius of fiber too. This image to the left is a service loop of fiber coming out directly out of the Atlantic Ocean <laughs> and with the labels to the right telling you a little bit about how crazy that technology is maybe 10,000 volts of DC applied to either end that grounds out in the middle to power the optical amp amplifiers in the middle so that was a terrific project and as an example of the kind of fun I had in the national lab system this theme will come back later in the talk 
Um, but then I did something unexpected. Um, really, I never expected to leave the DOE system, but um, about five years ago, I became the second employee of a startup, uh, CoreLight, uh, commercializing an open source project that I became really familiar with in my time at DOE. It was called Bro, then now called Zeek. The community has given it a new name. Uh, and the, the arrows there are bi-directional because CoreLight is an open core company, so it exists in symbiotic relationship with the community uh, and pours a lot of energy into sustaining the community. And the community, uh, in turn, um, provides uh, a, a technical foundation for Corelight's projects. That's the way the business works. And we see ourselves in, uh, in the, the line of this heritage of great uh, open source companies, especially ones focused on uh, network analysis. If you don't know about Zeek, I will just, because there's a bit about Zeek in this talk, and you may have learned from Matt or other um, instructors in the Sands Institute, but I'll just say it's um, become the kind of gold standard globally for making sense of network traffic, uh, mostly to support security workflows, not always, but often to support incident response and forensics. At one layer, it is deep packet inspection, really good high quality packet inspection. It produces summaries, value neutral, sort of agnostic summaries of what happens on the wire. Um, they're quite compact. So they're about a hundred times smaller than the associated PCAP but they have a lot more richness in terms of events and data than NetFlow. So they're the kind of Goldilocks sweet spot um, for incident response and forensics. And it's a really common SOC tool. Uh, it's also above that uh, a, an ecosystem. I, I don't mention it here, but there's tons of really interesting integrations, but the, it's also an ecosystem for apps. And some, some apps have been contributed by folks actually who are speaking here or have spoken at this conference. And a lot of organizations and companies have contributed protocol parsers. Amazon did that recently, or applications, Salesforce, Yahoo, and others, MITRE, NCSA, and my own former organization, and lots of others have contributed to that uh, burgeoning ecosystem of apps for mostly behavioral detection. Okay, so that's a little background on me and sort of the context of the talk. Uh, so the, the main topic of the talk is something I've been noticing, and I bet you have too, which is a beginning of a swing uh, in the pendulum of conventional wisdom from a really strong focus on endpoint, a little bit more towards a balanced perspective that includes network as well. And this pendulum has swung back and forth like many pendula, I guess that's the plural, uh, in the history of InfoSec. Uh, but I've really noticed this happening, especially in the last um, couple of years, and we see it too in our business. It's interesting. I think there's a number of causes for it. Um, certainly it helps that Gartner has sort of officially um, blessed the category ND, oh, excuse me, NDR, Network Detection and Response. Uh, and the market guide for that came out in June. The, just what the acronym would be, I think was a little uncertain in the last couple of years, but this has emerged as the acronym and it has a nice kind of parallelism with EDR or endpoint detection and response. And Gartner has been um, promoting this notion of the SOC triad. NDR is typically deployed for breadth. EDR might be deployed for depth. Uh, NDR offers ground truth, um, and you know it's really good for also for managing unmanaged, for, for monitoring unmanaged and unmanageable hosts. And that's another motivation I think for the swing of the pendulum. I tried to find some good reliable data for this, and I couldn't find any, frankly, that I wouldn't have to pay for, and then I don't think I'd be able to share it. But I'll say um, it, the, it looks almost certain that the number of unmanaged and unmanageable hosts will greatly exceed the number of managed by 2025, maybe by a factor of five. Uh, and that might that crossover might have already happened. So I'm calling this phenomenon U greater than M uh, in the rest of this talk. Uh, just one final bit of evidence. I was talking to a pretty senior exec at one of the major EDR uh, companies last week who said NDR is always in the top three topics people ask us about, which is interesting because it's not an NDR company. So this got me thinking as we prepare for U greater than M, for unmanaged greater than managed, is there any precedent for that kind of situation where um, you can't really rely on endpoint detection, but you have to focus all your energy on network detection? That would be an unusual environment, kind of weird, um, kind of extreme. Uh, but I think extremity is uh, interesting and illuminating because it leads to adaptation. Here's Matt Damon living on Mars. He learned to grow potatoes in the extremity of his situation. So what would happen in the extreme situation that I described? 
And a good model for that actually is in the culture that I um, originated in before I joined Corelight. And that's the culture of global team science. This is the uh, supercomputing center at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. I actually had my office in this building before I, before I took the leap into startup land. And global, I wanna stress that global team science is a little bit less well understood than traditional uh, university-centric science. A lot of people are comfortable, I think, with the notion that in university-centric science, there's a, there's a principal investigator, a PI, who receives funding typically from the National Institutes for Health, National Science Foundation, and the money goes to a pretty small team. And these teams, you may think of universities as highly collaborative, but they're actually very entrepreneurial teams. And they're not that large. They, they, sometimes they get a bit bigger with co-PIs, but often it's just Amazon's two pizza rule. You know, it's, it can be just a few people, maybe it's a dozen. And the output is amazing. It's, it's just an amazing tra tech transfer, mentorship, um, training students and researchers, and of course, advancing the frontiers of human knowledge, Nobel Prizes. On the flip side, scaling way, way up, there's another model for, for science that's, um, that's in action all around the world, actually. It's a little more like NASA in scale. So this is truly global. The funding comes from nation states or coalitions of nation states in the US, most of it from the Department of Energy, which funds half the physical sciences in the US. And it goes into building massive infrastructures that exist on decadal scale. Uh, now they have the same output, but the culture is really different massive collaborations that may last for decades. Um, and this is the culture that I grew up in, billion dollar instruments, fundamental discoveries, Nobel prizes. In fact, the Department of Energy or its predecessor organizations are responsible for 100, over 100 Nobel prizes, which is just mind boggling to me. It's this incredibly successful, underappreciated factory for discovery, for curiosity, curiosity-based science, but also applied science to solve um, critical human problems like climate change and, and others. So what's it like to be a defender in this context? I lived that, I was mostly a network engineer, but I certainly um, lived at the intersection of security as well. And it's a really interesting environment. Um, for one thing, it's all of your customers, their work product is to invent new techniques, architectures, and protocols, literally new network protocols. Um, they're routinely created in these environments. They typically require bleeding edge performance, networking, file IO, computational performance, tons of devices that can't be managed. This picture at the left is the uh, multi-billion dollar, I think, Atlas detector at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, one of the two detectors that provided evidence for the discovery of the Higgs boson, a, a massively important discovery in fundamental physics. And it's, it's very, um, it's, there are lots and lots of embedded devices there that aren't gonna run EDR instrumentation. It's really hard as a result of these other factors to define what normal traffic is. There's no clear boundary between the inside and outside, uh, et cetera. Uh, so defenders in that environment are really constantly adapting to lots of interesting patterns, big collaborations, global collaborations involving maybe dozens of countries constantly shifting as grad students and undergraduates come in and out of the collaborations. Um, so these are just a couple, but the US Department of Energy funds just within the US its own um, portfolio about 30 massive facilities and also contributes to dozens of others outside the US. So each of these has a big community e ecosystem and, and um, constantly sh shifting collaborations. There's also this, I call this B BYO sequencer problem. So um, the number uh, and variety of connected devices is just just amazingly baffling. So you've got the Palomar Observatory there. You've got the world's most powerful supercomputers. You've got accelerators. At the lower left is this fascinating portable device that's actually a genomic sequencer made by a company called Oxford Nanopore and that, yes, connects to your Mac with a um, USB connection. Those are actually relatively cheap and they pour a torrent of data out. Uh, you know, community colleges can afford those now, actually. So yes, there are traditional servers and laptops and phones, et cetera, but even those, a lot of those are brought in and out of the collaborations dynamically. Um, and then the, the networks themselves are of staggering magnitude. So years and years and years ago, ESNet, the organization I used to manage, built the world's first 100 gig continental network along with Internet2 long before carriers did. Uh, and we had the first 400 gig production link quite a long time ago. This little poster on the left is, uh, tells some of the basics about the square kilometer array, which is sort of the limit case on the network side of what this all means. This is going to be when it's built the world's largest uh, radio telescope uh, in massive uh, throughout Southern Africa and Australia. And the 
the combined network output of the detectors is 157 terabytes, which is about a petabit per second, um, which greatly exceeds the bisectional bandwidth capacity of the internet or did in 2015. Now that's not gonna come over Comcast links. It's gonna be reduced at multiple stages of computation. Uh, supercomputers will do that work. But even as it spits out, the, the process data is gonna be pretty formidable. So those are the challenges. And uh, what's interesting, actually, this is a bit of a digression, but I'm interested in the way our largest enterprise customers at Corelite are sort of inhabiting this surprisingly similar world now. Um, more and more devices that can't be managed. The, the network performance and other sorts of performance may not be quite so bleeding edge, but you know, actually the COVID time reminds us how ubiquitous video and remote work are becoming much, much more important. Lots of new protocols and techniques and architectures arising. Um, ubiquitous encryption, container um, application design, microservices, cloud, et cetera. So a lot of these same attributes apply to our, uh, our largest customers now, which is sort of interesting. Um, but, but the point I really want to make here is that in that scientific environment, what evolved what a, through adaptation was really much better tools for visibility and a suite of open source uh, projects for getting to network ground truth and also an ecosystem of community of community uh, defense. So the acronyms have changed over time. Uh, NDR was something else, it was NTA, it was in NSM. They're not exactly the same, they're not isomorphic, but, but I do wanna make the case that this idea has a really powerful open source heritage. And this isn't just a kind of um, um, funny thesis on my part. I mean, it's historically true that the people that wrote TCB dump and libpcap uh, and Zeke, so that's Steve McCann and Vern Paxson, where they were grad students working in a team at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. They were sharing an office, you know, they had cubicles, they were young people, and they were working to support accelerators. They were working in the real-time systems group whose customers were mostly accelerators. So this, this, this is the sort of historical root of um, that kind of idea, or one of them, it's an important one. And roughly at the same time, other projects evolved too, um, or same time, or maybe a little bit later, some a bit earlier. And these were embraced by lots of universities who had the same sort of workflows, um, national labs, large scale facilities, DOD, federal agencies. And then they were actually rapidly commercialized by lots and lots of companies. Uh, there's a great book that tells some of this um, history. If you don't know it, The Practice of Network Security Monitoring, a classic by my colleague at Corelight, Richard Baitlick, and a tremendous person. So um, I call this a design pattern. It's NDR is more than a product category. It's something more interesting. It's compelling and it's, um, it's, it's a design pattern. A lot of people learned about design patterns through this great book, a classic on object-oriented software. If you're into writing software, this is a good one to read. It's a historical document now, but it, but it influenced a lot of developers um, you know, 10 to 15 years ago. But if you're really interested in the roots of the idea, I would take you back to this book, A Pattern Language by the architectural historian Christopher Alexander. And he was interested in tracing the fact that the same architectural structures popped up all around the world, not because anyone really invented them, because they it's just because they had to exist. Like no one really invented the courtyard or the hearth or the porch or the door or the arch, or it was reinvented in different ways all around the world. And he called those structures that sort of inevitably had to exist design patterns. Uh, it's a cool book, it has a lot of neat sketches in it. Um, and I think the cluster of technologies that evolved around network traffic analysis um, bears this, it has the same sort of um, inevitability to it. All over the place, you could see that universities and national labs and other organizations were deploying roughly the same technology stack sometimes with um, different layers swapped out um, for the same purposes. And that ecosystem, that design pattern has grown uh, over time. Here, here's this idea a little more schematically because I'm a networker, I see it in layers. So we, we, we kind of go from traffic to action, you know, to automation, um, but starting with network bits, move, moving, there is a kind of backstop in this design pattern of packets. A lot of people still use PCAP and rely on it. Zeke is there for metadata uh, and also for behavioral detections, suricata and snort for signature detections. There are many layers now and increasing ecosystems around analysis and into action. So here's a question. If all this is true and the history of NDR is open, um, shouldn't its future be open as well? Uh, and I think the answer is absolutely yes for, for a number of reasons. So, and remember I'm, 
at heart kind of a simple operator. Like I run networks, uh, I debug networks. I really love that kind of work. Um, and it strikes me, and I, and I think I was inspired too by early contact with the IETF, but it strikes me that protocols, network protocols are developed by people like you and me in the open, most of the time by standards bodies. And the platforms for parsing and analyzing them should be open and extensible as well because so, so that you don't block uh, on any vendor as the internet traffic profile rapidly evolves. It does evolve more, more quickly than most people realize. Um, I just don't think you should have to wait for a vendor for a parser or a behavioral detection technique uh, when, when great platforms exist with communities around them. And then as an operator, I have some wants as well, <laughs> maybe expressed a little more selfishly, but I really want a normative data format wherever I'm accessing network traffic. And that can even be on the end host to blur the boundary between network and host for a moment, or it can be in an electrical substation or in a container in the cloud, a microservices environment, traditional enterprise, north, south, east, west. I want the same data format. Um, and I want the data to be extensible. If I don't like what the India, what say Zeek or whatever tool I'm using has decided to extract around say radius or LDAP, I want to extend that, adapt it, down select, uh, up select. And I wanna be able to export it everywhere and I wanna filter it. Um, and I also want, a, I have a lot of preferences about what detections I choose to deploy because they're tailored for my risk not model of my environment. So I want extensibility, transparency, and I want access to community leverage. So these strike me as really good reasons that NDR kind of structurally wants to be open just as it has been open in the past. And I will say, if you're not plugged into these ecosystems, they are really thriving at the moment. There's a lot of evidence. And I, I will apologize because this slide is highly Zeek centric. Um, so I have a selection bias, it's my community of origin. And so I've just put some examples here of recent community detections, recent community parsers. Uh, I think I missed a recent parser actually, unfortunately, a good one. But um, the same kind of dynamism and creativity is happening in the Suricata community, Snort, Wireshark, lots of others. Um, I've also highlighted the um, contributions, community contributions that are relevant to encrypted traffic streams because there's obviously a rising tide of encryption. Uh, and in many cases, traffic shouldn't be and won't be terminated and decrypted. And that's a good thing. In some cases, in the right legal and privacy framework, it can be. And in those cases, you know, you can get a lot more juice out of the network traffic analysis. But even if you can't, um, there's a lot you can extract. And I'd say the community is working on that, extracting all the signal that's possible, looking at correlations between maybe thousands or millions of simultaneous flows, looking carefully at timestamps. And that is something that our own research team led by our chief scientist, Vern Paxson, who created Zeek, uh, is focused on very strongly at the moment. These are just community, not, not commercial contributions. Uh, I think there was a talk on MITRE Bazaar, this really cool, um, Zeek package to implement some of the attack based detections in Zeek last year at this conference. So shout out to that. You should look, learn about Bazaar if you don't. JA3 and the Hash Project, originally from Salesforce, have gotten a lot of publicity. They're awesome. Um, and I think available on Suricata too, not just Zeek. And lots of others here. I would point out many of them were responsive to really signif significant severe CVEs and the community responded within a day or two to get a detection out so it could be widely shared. And there's more, there's m many more examples than are on these couple of pages, but I'd say community ID is a really cool community sort of NDR notion of um, a standard way of doing flow hashing so that if you need to stitch together a Suricata alert with a contextual data that Zeek might provide, you can use um, a standard um, identifier to pivot between one set of data and the other. And that's been, um, that was implemented initially by Christian Krebeck, my colleague, uh, at Corelight and a, a network researcher in his own right, but it's also been taken up by lots of other projects you can see here, including Suricata. Um, there's a new project I would call attention to by my uh, co-founder at Corelight called Spicy. We've open sourced it, it's completely open, it's distinct from the Zeek project, and it's a new platform for parsing both network traffic at a low layer, and so you can think of it as protocol parsing, but also file parsing. It makes it easy to create parsers without learning some arcane art or writing in C++ and it makes it safe and performant. And so a lot more people will be able to write parsers as a result of this. We'll use it in Zeek, but it could be put into Wireshark or other projects as well. So it's just getting started. You can learn about it over on the Zeek community Slack. 
And there's been a lot of really exciting integrations. Again, this is pretty Zeek centric because of my Zeek tunnel vision, <laughs> understandably, but the OS query Zeek integration is really exciting through a project called Zeek Agent, bridging the host network divide to some extent. Um, Sigma Zeek integration is exciting to us. If you don't know about Sigma, I won't describe it here, but please learn about it. It's a, it's a cool generic format for SIM queries. Zeek and Elastic have been bridged. There's lots more of these um, and there's more coming. So um, I wanna wrap up with a call to action actually. Um, first to, to stress the network detection and response is it's a project, it's a product category, but that's not the most interesting thing about it. It's really um, historically an interesting, compelling design pattern. It has an open past and I think it has um, a destiny to remain open. The swing that I've described sort of from EDR to MDR, and I don't think the world should swing totally in the opposite direction, but I think we need a balanced approach to detection. That swing is great for uh, the communities that I participate in, but it's also a really good way to build your career. Um, community itself is a great way to build your career. So I wanna challenge you to get involved in an open source project and to ask yourself if you're not involved in one, why? It's, a, it's really fun, it's gratifying, and I, I think some of the best professional experiences I've ever had um, have been about community, have been really outward facing. Um, that was true when I worked in human rights, certainly true in networking. It's true when I supported open science, and it's definitely true in my current role um, at CoreLight. So I, I would also add, just for, to inject a little bit of self-interest into the discussion, that today security resumes, IT resumes, are really built around GitHub, Slack channels, blog posts, mailing lists, talks like this one, besides talks. So community is, is actually really powerful. It can kind of slingshot your career a little bit. And just as if almost on cue, I found this in Twitter yesterday. I found this nice posting from Purdue University. Um, Purdue was celebrating uh, a young woman who was an undergraduate, I think, maybe a grad student, who had a research project um, as she was completing her degree to add um, Zeek, open source Zeek, to the research network at Purdue. And that experience got, helped get her uh, a job at Facebook. I'm sure it wasn't the only thing. I'm sure she was talented and articulate and she earned that. Um, the, the critical thing I think is that this experience was accessible to her as a student because the tools were open and the communities were welcoming. And she used that opportunity to transition to a pretty interesting job. You can do that too. And I'd say if networking isn't your thing, it's not your jam, that's okay. There's lots of adjacent communities. There's open EDR communities actually, open Intel um, that could be in the center of this bullseye. Uh, and closing that is a sort of open sock ecosystem that's even larger. I have a spreadsheet that I keep at work um, that sort of tracks, tries to track a lot of the open sock projects and it's impossible. It's an impossible task because they're always um, developing, merging, evolving and coming to birth. And then more broadly than that is, is a movement that has been very well described and named. Naming is very important by John Lambert at Microsoft. He's a distinguished engineer there called, he, he calls the movement the Githubification of InfoSec. And I won't do justice to his account of this, but I think if you haven't read his essay, you should Google that phrase and read it. It's really cool, it's compelling. It contains a call to action as well. It certainly influenced me. Um, and it's sort of a nice flag for this entire um, movement that I described, which is actually broader than open NDR. Now you may say, I'm not a developer, um, I'm an operator. And I might've said that myself uh, back in the day, I can write scripts to get my job done, um, maybe reluctantly, <laughs> I'd rather dive into the da data and solve problems, um, but that's okay. So lots of people get involved in communities who aren't uh, you know, really strong developers. You can hone those skills, um, but I'm influenced here by my colleague, Amber Grainer at Corelight, who. Um, is community director for the Zeek project. And she likes to say this is a lattice, so not a ladder. And that's a really nice metaphor. In a lattice, first of all, there's no one linear progression. There's no one right way to, to progress. And secondly, there are lots of intersecting points of your roles and interests and opportunities to engage. And those opportunities are broader than most people realize. It's not just scripting and coding. There's QA work, there's CI, there's documentation newsletters, webinars, events, interviews, just simple feedback. Like I was confused by this um, 
FAQ answer, or there seems to be a missing on-ramp document here uh, for the project. Would you like me to try to write it? That, that kind of stuff is incredibly valuable. Actually, your fresh eyes as a newcomer to a community are one of the most valuable things you can bring. So you just, in most of these communities, you just have to join, raise your hand and say, I'm here, how can I help? And it's, it's that simple. I have some links here for where to get started. I would look at the MITRE ATT&CK um, website first. There's some Zeek links here. Zeek now has a nice getting started in the community website. There's also a cool um, online implementation of Zeek. It's interactive, so you can try Zeek scripting. But all the communities I mentioned, and, and many more, of course, that I wasn't able to mention, have these sorts of welcoming portals. Most of them do. If they don't, it's not that they mean to be unwelcoming. So you can, if, if you're inspired by a community, you can almost certainly find a way to contribute. So this is my final message. I, I hope that um, you will consider contributing to a common ecosystem that you care about. It will make you feel better about your work. It will improve the ecosystem. It will Im improve this notion that I strongly believe in, in common cause among defenders. And that's really important to me that we can crowdsource solutions and we can stabilize the internet and uh, make it defensible for all the things we care about in life. All right, I think that was my last slide. So I wanna thank a little, just a few people in my personal community who contributed uh, feedback and ideas for this presentation. Richard Daitlick, Freddie DeJure, Aaron Soto, known to some of you, Amber I mentioned, John Gamble, Johanna Aman, a researcher on our team in SSL, and also an independent researcher, uh, Christian Kybeck, Brian Dye, uh, for feedback and contributions. And thank you so much to the SANS community for the invitation to talk today.